Greetings to you once again. I'm here doing fine in the Lord. I thank God because of you as well. I believe the Lord has kept you and that you are progressing well with your studies. Let's just begin our class with a word of prayer. Father God Almighty, you are highly lifted up. You are wonderful and you are amazing God. You are robed in majesty and lifted far above the firmaments of the earth. You are great and your greatness is unsearchable. You are faithful and your faithfulness is beyond human comprehension. We are grateful to you this wonderful moment. As we begin our class, we are asking that Lord you may begin with us. Until we come to the end, we shall always be grateful to you. Bless every student, bless the class and give us some good time full of inspiration and the move of the Holy Spirit in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you once again and God bless you. Most welcome to this class. This should be Old Testament survey. This should be Old Testament survey. Old Testament survey. And this should be class 8. Class 8. Uh, we have gone through class 7 and we left it at uh, the book of Esther. And that one was ending the historical books. We say that first from the beginning that the Old Testament can be divided into five different groups and uh, we were dealing with the historical books and we are done because the book of uh, the historical books ends with Esther. Right now we want to begin what is called poetic and wisdom literature. This is poetic and wisdom, wisdom literature. This should be the third division. This should be the third division, poetic and wisdom literature. And we want to start doing the summary of the book of Job. Summary of the book of Job. Summary of the book of Job. The book of Job does not specifically name its author. The most likely candidates are Job, Elihu, Moses, and Solomon. So it's not clear exactly who wrote the book but there are suggestions by traditions that uh, perhaps it might be Job himself or some guy called Elihu. Also, there are possibilities that uh, it was written by Moses, perhaps. And uh, also Solomon. Solomon also is mentioned here because he was a man full of wisdom and actually was the wisest man on the planet Earth. And so he's being mentioned that perhaps he participated in writing this uh, poetic and wisdom book. The date and setting of this book, authorship of the book of Job would be determined by the author of the book of Job. If Moses was the author, the date will be around 1440 BC. If Solomon was the author, the date would be around 950 BC. Because we don't know the author, we can't know the date of writing. So it's not clear exactly who wrote the book. And these are the probable dates, okay? 
let's say probable dates for writing this book probable dates and uh, we can see if Job wrote the book then probably it was written around 1440 BC 1440 BC if it was Moses then probably it was written around 900 uh, sorry I need to get back a bit yes if it was a uh, job then it was 1440 BC if Solomon was author the date will be around 950 BC 950 BC 900 uh, this is Solomon sorry 950 BC Solomon so it's not clear exactly who wrote the book but uh, thank God it was written the purpose of writing this book the book of Job help us to understand the following Satan cannot bring financial and physical destruction upon us okay this is the purpose as to why the book was written so that we can learn and know that Satan cannot bring financial and physical destruction upon us unless it is by God's permission okay that's very key there and very strong Satan cannot bring financial physical destruction upon us unless it is by God's permission and if you read that book you will be able to see that uh, when Satan was just roaming around then God asked him that uh, where are you coming from and he said I was just ro roaming around the world or the earth then he was asked have you seen my servant Job and of course he said yes but again he realized that God loves Job so much and for that reason he decided to accuse Job before God that Job loves you because you've given him a lot of wealth and uh, God allowed him to go and prove Job and when God was uh, allowing the devil the devil thought that it's true he will be able to lure Job and by taking everything from him then he will deny uh, his fear of God or he will, he will just lose his integrity and recant his faith but that wasn't possible because we can see that uh, when he tempted Job by God's permission God maintained his integrity no matter the pressure manipulation and intimidation that he went through he maintained his integrity even the wife told him that Job you'd rather just curse God and die because this is too much problem and pressure upon your head but he said I cannot do such a wicked thing so he remained faithful to God remember what we had learned before that no matter the situation you are going through the challenges and the tough circumstances you're in maintain your integrity this is what Job did this is what Abraham did this is what David did and so Job remained faithful hopeful and trusting in God and God alone the things of this world could not deter him from trusting God fully and keeping his faith in God so this lesson teaches us that uh, Satan cannot bring financial or physical destruction upon us unless it is by God's permission something else is that God has power over what Satan can do and cannot do because God restrained him that don't touch his heart touch his body do anything you want but don't touch his heart so God is overall he's more powerful and he knows to which level there must be a line drawn that don't pass here that's why every time we are tempted and tried we must know that God is on our side and there is a limit 
that God cannot allow the devil to get to. Uh, it is beyond our human ability to understand the wise behind all the suffering in the world. The wicked will receive their just dues. We cannot always blame suffering and sin on our lifestyles. Suffering may sometimes be allowed in our lives to purify or to test or to teach or strengthen the soul. So not all challenges and bad things that happen to us <coughs> sorry that uh, as a, a result of our ignorance or maybe uh, background or just by ourselves but some may come as a result of God permitting so that we can be molded in our character remember what we learned in leadership about character shaping and the making of a servant of God that God has to uh, uh, to allow you to undergo some situations difficulties to be precise so that you can be hardened even to trust more in God and not in the things of this world so when you go through diverse temptations what does the Bible says that do not be dismayed do not be worried because God who is in you is greater than he who is in the world no matter the attempts the devil can never win over God and so God remains enough and he deserves and requests our love and praise in all circumstances of life we should not be moved by whatever is happening around us let us charge God faithful as he is and trust him let him be enough and nothing else I want us to look at the key verses from this book of Job. Uh, let's talk about key verses. Which are the key verses we can point out and say that this carries out the main uh, lesson. And this is Job chapter 1 verse 21. Chapter 1 verse 21. Uh, yes, Job chapter 1 verse 21. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked will I depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. Wow, this is so powerful. Uh, this is so powerful because uh, Job in his misery, he chooses to trust God. He never blamed God. In fact, he's saying, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall go back. The Lord has given, and the Lord has taken. He lost all his children. It was so pathetic to lose all your children. Okay? This is one of the worst scenarios ever. If you lose your entire family children. We have seen in today's world, you hear of a crash. And the car of five people died all together in the crash, etc. Some die in plane crashes, and some die by some massives, etc., etc. But see to it that out of this scenario, Job is saying, nothing to worry about. It is well with my soul. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return. But all, out of all this, the Lord uh, is to be praised, okay? Let the Lord be praised. Whatever you are in, no matter what you are facing, God is enough. It is well with your soul. Cram and uh, internalize these words. Let them give you solace. Let them give you strength to continue. Another key verse is chapter 38, verse 1 to 2. Chapter 38, verse 1 to verse 2. <clears throat> then the Lord answered Job out of the storm. He said, Who is this that darkens my counsel with words without knowledge? Okay. Uh, another key verse is 42 verse 5 to 6, 42 verse 5 up to verse 6.
my ears had heard of you but now my eyes have seen you therefore i despise myself and repent in dust and ashes now uh, this is one of the verses i like quoting so much because job came to a point whereby he was a witness of the doing of God himself. You don't have to be told all the time. May God appear to you in person. May God speak to you and not through others. A time may come that God may speak to you in person and he may encourage, challenge you until you give him all the glory. Uh, just like in the case of Pharaoh, Pharaoh used to hear that God of Israel is powerful and he does great things. But a time came he had to see with his own eyes, right in the land of Egypt, all the plagues that he went through. But eventually the last of them was the worst, where all the firstborns died. But in Goshen land, where the children of God dwelt, everything was okay. The blood of the Passover lamb was on the doorpost and the angel of death could bypass the Israelites. So after this, Pharaoh saw it and decided to let the Israelites go. Now brief summary about this book of Job. At the beginning of the book of Job is a scene in heaven where Satan stands before God and God asks Satan, have you considered my servant Job? In Job chapter 1 and verse 8. And Satan immediately accuses Job, a righteous man of fearing God, only because God had prospered him. Well, this accusation, it do happens. Most people, they love God because of what God has given them, but they don't love God from their hearts. If whatever they are having could be taken away, then they could just forsake and recant their faith in God. And so the devil thought that maybe, perhaps, uh, Job is of the same mind. Because the devil, remember, is not all-knowing. Only God is all-knowing. And the devil is limited to information. Unless we speak them out, then he grabs the words we've spoken and takes advantage over those words, okay? But God is all-knowing. So the devil didn't know that uh, 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 Job loved God, not because of the things God has given him, but because he's delighted in the law of God. This makes the difference. Do you love God because of what God has given you or do you love God because he is God and you love him from within your heart? This was the scenario or the state of Job. So the devil tried to accuse Job and we can see strike everything he has. That was the advice of Satan. Uh, say, he says, Satan says, and he will surely cast you to your face in Job 1 verse 11. Remember the devil is the accuser and so he's accusing Job here before God. God grants certain limited permission to put Job to the test. Why do the righteous suffer? This is the question raised after Job loses his family, his wealth and his health. Job's three friends Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar come to comfort him and his, uh, to discuss his crushing series of tragedies, okay? At least everybody would want to see his best friends around him when he's going through difficult moments. And so this was the case that these three friends came to Job and we can see they insist his suffering is punishment for sin in his life. Just the same way every time, every day, people are judging us and misjudging us. Every time you undergo some situation, 
they accuse you, they accuse me, they accuse us of sin maybe in our lives. Job though remains devoted to God through all of this and contends that his life has not been one of sin. A fourth man, Elihu, tells Job he needs to humble himself and submit to God, use of trials to purify his life. Finally, Job questions God. Okay, Job questions God himself and learns valuable lessons about the sovereignty of God and his need to totally trust in the Lord. Job is then restored to health, happiness, and prosperity beyond his earlier state. Nobody is able to talk to God on your behalf better than yourself. So no matter what their, his friends were saying or doing or planning, Job decided to talk to God himself. The best person to talk to God is you. Don't keep on asking your pastor to pray for you. Of course, he can pray for you and he is praying for you. But take time and speak to God yourself. Talk to God one on one and tell him what ails you. Let him know your desire. Let him know exactly what you need. Don't keep giving people burdens. Brethren, pray for me, pray for me. But rather yourself, you can take yourself and humble yourself before God and God will meet you at the point of your need. We can see the case of Job. He's the same person that decided to talk to God in person and God revealed himself to him. And we can see that after this situation, he learned a lot of things. And I want us now to move on and look at something called foreshadowing. What does this book of Job teach us? What lessons can we draw from the same book, okay? As Job was pondering the cause of his misery, of course we are human. We have to think, why? Why am I going through this? Of course, can it be as a result of sin? Yes, at times it can be as a result of sin. But at times it might not be as a result of sin, but God has allowed a situation so that we can learn some lessons and bond strongly with him. And so that's the good thing with searching our hearts and reflecting upon our own self because by that we will be able to know exactly what's happening in our lives okay so three questions came to his mind all of which are answered only in our lord jesus christ these questions occur in chapter 14 first in verse 4 and job asks Who can bring what is pure from the impure? No one, okay? Now, this is so interesting. Job is asking a question and he answers himself because he has the fear of God. He is fully convinced and persuaded that God is in control over everything. Are you convinced that God is the overall that shows some substance of faith in Job or in a person. So he is answering the same question he's asking no one. Job's question comes from a heart that recognizes it cannot possibly please God or become justified in his sight, okay? God is holy. And we are not, of course, that's the truth. Therefore, a great gulf exists between man and God, caused, caused by sin. But the answer to Job's anguished question is found in Jesus Christ. He has paid the penalty for our sin and has exchanged, 
okay, it for his righteousness, thereby making us acceptable in God's sight, according to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14. He has pray, paid our debts, and we are free, and therefore we are acceptable in God's sight. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14. At the same time, you can find it in uh, Colossians 1 verse 21, Colossians chapter 1 verse 21, and also 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17. Okay. Job's second question. But man dies and lies prostrate. Man expires, and where is he? that is in verse 10 it's another question about eternity and life after death that is answered only in Christ okay with Christ the answer to where is he is eternal life in heaven without Christ the answer is an eternity in outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth that's Matthew 25:30. Matthew 25 verse 30 talks about the separation from the sheep and the goats. The goats belong to Satan, but uh, the sheep belong to God. So we are the sheep. We belong to the fold and to the uh, fellowship of God. We remain to be in his family and we belong to him. That's where we are. So all these two questions, the first two questions, were answered also by Jesus Christ in the New Testament. It is Jesus who knows our future. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And so once we are dead from this life, we shall live with him forever in eternity. Let's look at the third question that Job is asking here, okay? Job's third question found in verse 14 is, if a man dies, will he live again? Okay. Once again, the answer is found in Christ. We do indeed live again if we are in him. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that it is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? First Corinthians 15, verse 54 to 55. Now, that answer is very clear in almost the entire New Testament that, yes, of course, we shall live again. And where shall we live? We shall live in glory. All those who died in the Lord, we shall all meet again by that beautiful shore, right in glory on that beautiful shore. And we shall live again forever and ever in eternity. We want to finalize uh, that book of Job by looking at the practical applications how can we apply the lessons we've learned from this book into our today's life? How can we apply these scripture passages into our lives? The book of Job reminds us that there is a cosmic conflict going on behind the scenes that we, shall, we usually know nothing about. Wait, this is the practical application. When we were looking at uh, spiritual warfare, which I believe you all went through, we learned that there is cosmic battle between the forces of light and the forces of darkness, okay? And so it is evidenced in this uh, book of Job, and we are standing on the side of God because if we stand by ourselves, we will be defeated. But when we stand on God's side, we shall conquer. Okay? We shall conquer no matter what come our way. Often we wonder why God allows something 
and we question or doubt God's goodness without seeing the full picture, okay? I've heard so many people questioning God. Why could God just decide to destroy the devil, okay? And just forget about all these trouble and problems in this life. But God has the answer. The book of Job teaches us to trust God and our circumstances. Whatever his decision, we shall follow. Whatever he decides to do with us, let him do it because not our will but his will be done okay and so we must trust god not only when we do not understand but because we do not understand the psalmist tells us as for god his way is perfect okay bear in mind every time before you question god bear in mind that all his ways are perfect that is psalms chapter 18 verse 30 not psalm not a few, but all his ways are perfect. If God's ways are perfect, then we can trust that whatever he does and whatever he allows is also perfect, okay? If indeed God is perfect, so everything he does is perfect. Everything he allows is perfect. So he allowed the situation of Job and it was perfect because Job never ended uh, in mis uh, misery, but he ended up in glory. He was glorified. God vindicated him. But the chastisement, God chastises those that he loves, okay? If you see God chastising you, then know that he loves you. You as a parent, you cannot chastise a child that you don't love, okay? You allow them to do whatever they want because they have gone beyond what you expected, okay? So God the same, he is a father and he chastises those that he loves. If he decided to allow some situation in my life, in your life, then definitely it is perfect. He knows why. This may not seem possible to us, but our minds are not God's mind. It is true that we can't expect to understand his mind perfectly, as he reminds us. For my thoughts are not your thoughts very clear, neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For thoughts uh, for the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. That's Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8 to 9. Isaiah 55, verse 8 to 9. Nevertheless, our responsibility to God is to obey Him, to trust Him, and to submit to His will, whether we understand it or not, okay? Our sole duty and obligation is to obey God, live for Him, whether it seems pleasing or not, His ways are perfect. And we are not to wait for God to come into our way of corruption and uh, uh, the way to uh, the wrong direction, but we should align our thoughts, our mind, our ways with the mind of God, with the word of God. And that brings us to the end of the summary of the book of Job. We want to proceed with the second book and this is summary of the book of Psalms. Summary of the book of Psalms. Summary of the book of Psalms, okay. The brief description that introduced the Psalms have David listed as author in 73 instances, okay. David listed as author 
Okay, 73 instances. David's personality and identity are clearly stamped on many of these Psalms. In the actual sense, some they call it Psalms of David, okay? So, while it is clear that David wrote many of the individual Psalms, he is definitely not the author of the entire collection, okay? Two of the Psalms, 72 and 127, are attributed to Solomon, uh, 72 and 127. 72 and uh, 127 these are chapters okay uh, attributed to Solomon attributed to Solomon and we all know that Solomon was a son to David by Bathsheba okay These ones are attributed to Solomon, David's son and successor. Psalms 90 is a prayer assigned to Moses. Psalms 90. 90. Prayer assigned to Moses. Prayer assigned to Moses. Okay. Another group of 12 Psalms, 50 and uh, 73 to 83 is ascribed to the family of Asaph. Another group of 12 Psalms, 50 and 73 to 83. 50, 73 to 83 ascribed to Asaf family. Asaf family, okay? Psalms 88 is attributed to Haman. Psalms 88, 88, ascribed to to Haman. So it appears that there were so many authors that brought about the book of Psalms. Psalms 89 is assigned to Ethan and Ezra Height. Psalms 89, 89 assigned. Signed to Eden and Israelite. Eden and Israelite, okay. With the exception of Solomon and Moses, all these additional authors were priests or Levites who were responsible for providing music for sanctuary worship during David's reign, okay? 50 of the Psalms designate no specific person as author, although two of those are designated elsewhere in the Bible as Psalms of David, okay? So a few of the Psalms that have not been clear exactly who wrote them, in some other scriptures ascribe them to David and they are called Psalms of David and that's why uh, in theology we say that uh, uh, in hermeneutics to be precise a scripture interprets another scripture here a little there a little then it forms doctrine and the Bible is one unit all of it from Genesis to Revelation because one scripture complements another scripture 
Uh, let's move on and see uh, the date for writing this book. A careful examination of the authorship question as well as the subject matter covered by the Psalms themselves reveals that they may uh, they span a period of many centuries a period of many centuries also depending with these authors who never existed at the same period of time okay and so the oldest psalm in the collection is probably the prayer of Moses and that is Psalms 90 probably 137 a song of lament clearly written during the days when the Hebrews were being held captive by the Babylonians from about 586 to 538 BC. 586 586 up to 538 BC. 538 BC. That's oldest Psalms. Oldest Psalms. Uh, Psalms. So these are the Psalms that has been ascribed to Moses. And I said that that was uh, Psalms 90 and also 137. Psalms chapter 90 and, verse, and also chapter 137. Okay, so it talks about the children of Israel when they were still captives. Okay. In Babylon it is clear that the 150 individual Psalms were written by many different people across a period of a thousand years in Israel history Psalms covers a period of a thousand years okay a period of a thousand years in Israel's history. Israel's history. Okay. They must have been compiled and put together in their present form by some unknown editor shortly after the captivity ended about 537 537 put together together by unknown unknown author unknown author Okay. A non author that is in five thirty seven BC. Five thirty seven BC. Yes. So that's about the dates of writing this book. We want to go next to the purpose as to why this book was written. And the book of Psalms has far more chapters than any other book in the Bible. With 150 individuals, individual Psalms, it is also one of the most diverse since the Psalms deal with such subjects as God and His creation, war, worship, wisdom, and evil judgment justice and the coming of the messiah okay and that brings us to the key verses 
Let's look at the key verses in this book of Psalms. Key verses in the book of Psalms. Uh, this is summary. We are talking about key verses. Psalms 19 verse 1. Psalms 19 verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Okay. Psalms 22 16. 22, 16 to 19. 22, 16 to 19. Dogs have surrounded me. A band of evil men has encircled me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. Definitely that was speaking about Jesus Christ. It was typing Jesus, but we shall look at the application later. Psalms 23 verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Psalms 23 and verse 1, that's a very, very key verse and a common one. We started with, uh, reciting when we were very young. And also Psalms 29, verse 1 and 2. Uh, 29, verse 1 and 2. Let's see what it's all about. Ascribe to the Lord Almighty ones, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the, in he, in the splendor of his holiness. Okay, It's all about worship, worship. Most songs are being uh, taken or written from the book of Psalms, etc., etc. So Psalms 51 verse 10. This is 51, verse 10. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. And Psalms 119, verse 1 and 2. 119, verse 1 and verse 2. This is another very common scripture quoted. Blessed are they whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are they who keep his statutes and seek him with all their heart. And so we want to look at the brief summary of this book of Psalms. The book of Psalms is a collection of prayers, okay? You should note it very well. The book of Psalms is a collection of prayers, poems and hymns, that focus the worshippers thoughts on God in praise and adoration. Parts of this book were used as a hymnal in the worship services of ancient Israel. The musical heritage of the Psalms is demonstrated by its title. It comes from a Greek word which means a song sung to the accompaniment of a musical instrument. Okay. Uh, the word Psalms, okay, the word Psalms comes from a Greek word which means a song sung to the accompaniment of a musical instrument. Maybe you play the guitar, maybe you play the piano, maybe you play the drum set or saxophone, trumpet, flute, whatever the instrument, the harp, etc. So that's it about the book of Psalms. And we want to look about what is called foreshadowings. God's provision of a savior for his people 
is a recurring theme in the Psalms. Prophetic pictures of the Messiah are seen in numerous Psalms. In numerous Psalms, okay? Like in Psalms 2 verse 1 to 12, portrays the Messiah's triumph and kingdom, okay? Also Psalm 16 verse 8 to 11 foreshadows his death and resurrection. Psalms 22 shows us the suffering Savior on the cross and presents detailed prophecies of the crucifixion, all of which were fulfilled perfectly. The glories of the Messiah and his bride are on, the, on exhibit in Psalms 45 verse 6 to 7, while Psalms 72 verse 6 to 17 and 89 verse 3 to 37 Psalms 110 verse 1 to 7 and Psalms 132 verse 12 to 18 present the glory and universality of his reign. Okay, I know I've been a bit fast, but uh, you will have the notes for yourselves. Okay, uh, let's look at the practical application of this book of Psalms. One of the results of being filled with the Holy Spirit or the word of Christ is singing, okay? Uh, thank God for those who love singing. I like singing as well, and I've composed and written a number, a good number actually, of songs, okay? So that's very, very important. If you can sing, then sing and, wo sing and worship God. Compose songs, write songs, record songs, and let them be for God's glory. The Psalms are the songbook of the early church that reflected the new truth in Christ. God is the same Lord in all the Psalms, but we respond to him in different ways according to the specific circumstances of our lives. What a marvelous God we worship. The psalmist declares, high and lifted up beyond our human experiences but also close enough to touch and who walks besides us along life's way we can bring all our feelings to god no matter how negative or complaining they may be and we can rest assured that he will hear and answer understand the psalmist teaches us that the most profound prayer of all is a cry for help as we find ourselves overwhelmed by the problems of life, okay? <clears throat> so every time you are overwhelmed by circumstances and situations in your life, just go and cry to God. It's okay, it's uh, allowed to cry before God. That's the best prayer ever. The most profound prayer actually you can ever talk about. Just crying before God, I like it so much. Uh, it's very, very rare to find me shedding tears for any reason or by all means. But I'm very quick to shed tears when crying to God, always in prayer. I just find myself losing myself and just worship and adore His holiness. And that brings us to the end of the summary of the book of Psalms today as we finish with that point our class again until next class we shall proceed and look at the summary of the book of Proverbs. Thank you very much even for your concentration, for your class attendance and everything. God bless you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Bless you. Thank you for every student. Bless us all together as we wind up for your glory and honor. In Christ's name, amen. God bless you.